Al Jazeera Podcasts. Today, the worst attack on civilians in Moscow in years. The deadliest attack inside Russia in two decades. There was a lot of emotions, and there still is now. Most of it has turned into anger. Will the mass shooting at a music hall in Russia's capital undermine President Vladimir Putin's message of security? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. My name is Dorso Jabari. I'm a correspondent for Al Jazeera English, and I'm currently in the Russian capital, Moscow. I've been here now for about two weeks or so. I came for the Russian presidential elections. And Dorsa said those elections were fine. Critics from around the world have said the election was not free or fair, given the absence of any real political opponents. I think um, it all went according to plan, let's just say. But the calm was shattered on Friday night when news broke that gunmen had attacked a concert. We begin with breaking news out of Russia, where gunmen have killed at least 40 people after bursting into a concert hall in Moscow. We now know at least 137 people were killed. There were scenes of panic as the attack unfolded at the Crocus City Hall on the outskirts of the Russian capital. It was very much a surprise attack on Friday evening, the start of the weekend here. So people are usually out and about. I was at a restaurant with a friend of mine having dinner when I got the call. And it was very surprising. And the scale of the attack was also very much a surprise. It was, you know, clearly a well-coordinated, planned attack. It began with gunmen storming the hall, firing point-blank at people who had gathered for a rock concert. Camouflaged gunmen opening fire as people began screaming and ducking behind seats as gunshots echoed. In the end, flames engulfed City Hall as the building collapsed. That involved a multiple number of people. And um, the fact that the perpetrators set fire to the venue was also another factor. It wasn't just gunmen opening fire. They also set a blaze where they were. So there was people trapped and the building sustained extensive damage. So since then, on Saturday morning, people were very emotional. One survivor spoke to journalists. They started shooting at people who got in their way. They shot people indiscriminately, without saying a word. They shot in cold blood. We went to the scene. People that lived in that neighborhood, that visited that mall, it's one of the most well-known locations in Moscow. It's a big mall complex, big theater, and a big concert venue that has a capacity to hold just over 9,000 people. For the cleanup teams this morning, walking to the very spot from where the carnage was unleashed, it's a grim task. So people were very, very shocked. People were very angry, and we met people who were still waiting to find out their family members were missing. They didn't know if they were dead or they were in hospital. There was a lot of questions for people. So there was a lot of emotions, and there still is now. Most of it has turned into anger, I think, given what's happened. Throughout the city, we saw these posters of candles going up and all the different monitors that are placed throughout the streets. On Saturday, the attack was claimed by a branch of ISIL, ISIL ISIL-K, the Islamic State in Khorasan province. But the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, appeared on state TV in an address to the nation less than 24 hours after the attacks on Saturday afternoon. All four direct perpetrators of the attack, all those who shot and killed people, were found and detained. And he reassured the public that they're investigating it. They have 11 people in custody. Four of them are the gunmen that are now in detention. And he said that this will not divide the country. And he pointed the finger at Ukraine, even though ISIL-K, a branch of um, ISIS, claimed responsibility for the attack. He said that at least two of the gunmen were arrested while they were trying to escape in the Bryansk region towards the border with Ukraine. Putin said that they probably had some assistance from Ukrainian officials 
there was a window created for them to escape into Ukraine. We haven't had any evidence provided to us about details on this accusation. So this is what we have to go on at the moment. Along with the 137 known deaths, about 100 more are in hospital. Moscow was a city in mourning, and it still is very much. Officially, Sunday was declared a public day of mourning. Many people were donating blood. Over 5,000 people went to the different blood donation centers in the capital to donate blood. There are still thousands and thousands of flowers being laid um, at a makeshift memorial at the site of where the attack took place at Caracas City Hall. On Sunday, Dorsa covered the court appearance of the four men who've been arrested and accused of carrying out the attack. And the four men appear to be in pretty bad shape. Russia on Sunday charged four men it says are responsible for gunning down scores of people at a concert outside Moscow days earlier. We understand they're from Tajikistan, the four of them, and they range in age from 19 to 32. And they don't speak Russian. Most of the court proceedings happening, they were not aware what was being said. One of them was almost unconscious. He had to be brought in on a, in a wheelchair and he was accompanied by his doctor. Another man had a huge bandage over one of his ear. There were reports unconfirmed that one of the suspects, when he was arrested and being interrogated, they had cut off his ear. Of course, we can't verify this information, but one of the suspects in court had a clearly sustained some injuries to his ear. And the other two men also had been beaten pretty badly. You could see all the bruises on their faces. Now, we don't know if this happened while they were in custody or while they were being interrogated or it could have happened another time. We, or we don't know the details, but there are accusations that these men were tortured at the hands of the officials. And they appeared in court under very heavy security. Their proceedings were held behind closed doors. And they will now spend the next two months in detention while they wait for their trial to begin. And the four men, we understand, are being represented by state-appointed defense attorneys because nobody would willingly want to defend them. And so that's where things are at at the moment. We are seeing an increased security presence across Moscow. At my hotel where I'm staying at, people are being checked more thoroughly as they enter. And in the shopping centers across the capital, at least 10 bomb threats have been called in on Monday alone. So they had to evacuate the malls to check the threats. And um, there's more security at all the large shopping venues. A number of cultural events have been canceled. So this is certainly a city on high alert. So... What more is known about the group that claim responsibility for the attack? That's after the break. In Moscow, investigations are underway into the attack and who's behind it. As for the group that's claimed responsibility, it's known as ISIL's Afghan branch and named after Khorasan province in Afghanistan. Dorsa explained the context. ISIL-K is Islamic State Khorasan province, which is a group formed by uh, former Taliban members in Afghanistan. It was founded in 2015. And uh, the first major attack they carried out was in Kabul airport in August of 2021. The U.S. was withdrawing its troops from Afghanistan. As troops were overseeing the evacuation, twin suicide attacks near the Kabul airport killed at least 12 U.S. service members. 15 others were wounded. At least 90 Afghans were killed, 150 wounded. 
and they've had a number of other attacks, including the one in Iran earlier this year in January at the anniversary of the assassination of Qasem Soleimani at his tomb in Kerman that killed 84 people. And this group, ISIL-K, had said that they have problems with the Kremlin and they accused uh, Russian officials of having Muslim blood on their hands because of Russia's policies in Afghanistan, Chechnya, and Syria. But as to whether the group did carry out the attack in Moscow, people have floated different theories about who else could have carried it out or directed it. For President Putin, a chance to name drop Ukraine. Guilt by association. Russian President Vladimir Putin suggesting that Ukraine was linked to the attack. That's something that leaders in Kyiv and the administration also deny. A lot of analysts, both inside and outside of Russia, that are familiar with ISIL and how they work, believe this to be one of their trademark kind of attacks. But I think we can say that if the Russians believe it is ISIL, they believe it was done with the assistance of Ukrainian officials. The investigation is still ongoing, and um, the Kremlin spokesperson said that there is no coherent version of the, the attack, and that... There's preliminary data, so we need to wait for the information from the security agencies to assess exactly what they have. There were reports that during the interrogation, these four men said that they were paid by unknown parties to carry out this attack. But like I said, it's still very early on, so it's difficult to say. But from how it appears and from the U.S. intelligence that they had In Russia earlier this month, about two weeks before the attack, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow put out an alert saying to its citizens, avoid crowded gatherings. Uh, There is a high likelihood of a terror attack in a crowded area in Moscow. So the warnings had been there based on U.S. intelligence and Western intelligence. The Russian president at the time dismissed it and called it Western blackmail, trying to create hysteria in the country. Now, looking back, it's a different story. Until the attack... That story had been a promise of security from Putin to the Russian people. As for what it means now... Well, this is not good. It's uh, not a good start to his fifth term in office. He was just re-elected less than a week before this attack took place. So this is one of the first, one of the biggest challenges of his new presidency. And uh, he was very quick to put out a video message to the nation... Now the main thing is to not let those behind this bloodbath commit new crimes. He lit a candle in memory of the victims in his uh, summer residence on Sunday, which was the day of mourning in the country. So he's trying to project the image of a man still very much in charge of the country because one of the main points he had going for him with the public is that he has provided a safe and secure Russia for the people of this country. Now, this attack highlights the fact that it is not that safe in Russia if this kind of an attack on this scale could have taken place. But what he's managed to do over the past 72 hours is, A, they have four people in custody that have been arrested. The gunmen have been detained, apprehended. They are appeared in court. The second is that um, security measures have been heightened across the country. He has vowed revenge. And Vladimir Putin is still projecting the image that, you know, these attacks are an attempt by our enemies, i.e. Ukraine, to sow division within the country and it, it will not work. Then that was the message that we're getting from him. An attempt by Putin to show that, yes, There was a breach in the security intelligence, but we are now, again, in control of the country. And Dorsa said it's unlikely to have much effect on Putin's hold on power in Russia. I think what you have to understand is Russians are used to conflict, bloody conflicts. They're used to war. President Putin has weathered the storm through conflicts much bloodier than this. You know, the the second Chechnya war, he was in power, Ukraine and others. And at times like this, Russian people tend to turn to him for a sense of stability and comfort because he is someone they know. And they understand that these things are very difficult to prevent. 
in any country, not just Russia. So there is some um, questions about the security apparatuses and their abilities, but most people uh, don't blame Putin for this. Uh, and there, I don't think it's, it, he may suffer a slight blow to his popularity, like a few percentage, but I don't think he will be the one taking the blame for this. Meanwhile, the mood is still tense. We're just hearing now that there's more warnings from ISIL-K that they are going to carry out further attacks in Russia because they don't like the way their members have been treated while in custody. But in Russia, Dorsa says people are very angry at the number of people who have died. And they say they should be handled however the authorities think they should be handled. They should not get any proper treatment of any kind. I think that kind of... That line of thinking is considered here to be very, very Western. It's not how things are done in Russia. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by David Enders and Faranisa Kampana, with Chloe Kaylee, Ashish Malhotra, Sariyat Khalili, Amy Walters, Nagin Oliayi, Khalid Sultan, Miranda Lynn, Sonia Bagat, Zaina Bazir, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Joe Plord mixed this episode. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>